electrical signals. Cells produce electrical signals called action potentials. And this is going to transfer information from one part of the body to another. Now electric properties result from ionic concentration differences across the plasma membrane and also the permeability of that membrane. In other words, ions are going to have to cross from outside of the cell to inside of the cell or vice versa. That's going to change the what we call the membrane potential to make it either more positive or more negative. And this is what's going to create that electrical signal. Now the permeability of the membrane is going to depend on things like channels, for instance, these ion channels. A non-gated or leak channel is always open and responsible for permeability. It's specific to one type of ion, although that's not absolute. This kind of reminds me of an open door. A door is open. If you can fit through it, then you can go in and out. Same thing with uh, leak channels. Then we have gated ion channels. And an example here to the left is the ligand gated channel. Now to me, this reminds me of a key card. You have the key card, and that would be the ligand, in this case, the neurotransmitter acetylcholine. So that's your key card. It's going to attach to the receptor sites for the acetylcholine. That would be like the receptor that you would put your key card into. Once your key card is in, the door opens. Pull the key card out, the door closes. And then we have voltage gated ions. They open or close in response to small voltage changes. This reminds me of like when you go to the grocery store, you walk up to the door and there's this electric eye that kind of senses movement and then it sends a signal to the doors to open. Now resting membrane potential. The characteristics are the number of charged molecules and ions inside and outside the cell are nearly equal. The concentration of potassium is going to be higher inside the cell and sodium is going to be higher on the outside of the cell. Now they're both positively charged, but um, at equilibrium, there's very little movement of potassium or other ions across the plasma membrane. Now if channels open up, and sodium rushes in, so the sodium channels would open up, uh, and that sodium rushes in, now the inside of the cell is going to wind up being more positive than the outside of the cell, and this is what's going to then propagate an action potential. Now, just to kind of demonstrate that a little better, I think this animation in the next slide might help a little bit better. When the cell membrane is at its resting membrane potential, the activation gates of the voltage-gated sodium ion channels are closed and the inactivation gates are open. Voltage-gated potassium ion channels are closed. Depolarization is initiated by a stimulus which makes the membrane potential more positive, causing the voltage-gated sodium ion channels to start to open. As threshold is reached, many sodium channels open. Sodium ions diffuse across the membrane, causing depolarization. Voltage-gated potassium ion channels also begin to open, but more slowly. Therefore, depolarization occurs because more sodium ions diffuse into the cell than potassium ions diffuse out of it. As the membrane potential approaches maximum depolarization, the inactivation gates of the voltage-gated sodium ion channels begin to close and the diffusion of sodium ions decreases. The potassium ion channels remain open and potassium ions continue to diffuse out of the cell. The increased potassium ion permeability lasts slightly longer than the time required to bring the membrane potential back to its resting level. The extra efflux of potassium ions causes the membrane potential to become slightly more negative than the resting value. After the voltage-gated potassium ion channels close, 
the active transport of sodium and potassium ions reestablishes the resting membrane potential. Now local potentials can result from many different things. Some of the things are like what we looked at earlier, where ligands binding to receptors open up channels, and ions are going to cross through those channels, and it's going to give us a change in the charge across the membrane. Other things that can create a local potential or action potential is mechanical stimulation. For instance, a pressure receptor. If you compress that pressure receptor or other receptors that might be bent or stretched, that will then trigger an action potential. Temperature. We have hot and cold receptors. When they reach a certain temperature, either hotter or colder, again, an action potential is then propagated. Or we can even have a spontaneous change in permeability. You might have um, had that sometimes when your eye starts twitching. And these local potentials can be graded. The magnitude varies from small to large, depending on the stimulus, strength, or frequency. And they can also summate or add on to one another. Now, action potentials are a series of permeability changes when a local potential causes depolarization of the membrane. And the phases, depolarization is going to be more positively charged, whereas repolarization is going to be more negatively charged. And if we look at this, this uh, graph right here, it almost looks like an EKG, doesn't it? Well, that's exactly what we're looking at is the electrical potential of the heart as it depolarizes and repolarizes. And basically this is going to happen as an all or none principle, such as with a camera flash. If you go to take a picture or you press the little button on the back of the camera flash, as long as you keep, you keep pushing, keep pushing, and all of a sudden, as soon as the contacts make contact, it's going to flash. Now, if I push it gently, am I going to get a nice soft flash? If I push it a little more firmly, am I going to get a, a brighter flash? No, doesn't matter. Once threshold is reached, we're going to get a flash. And on those flash units, as soon as you take a, a photo or press that little test button and the flash happens, if you go to try to take another picture right away or press that button right away, nothing happens. And that's because the, the uh, flash is what we would call refractory period. So what's the refractory period? Sensitivity of an area to further stimulation is decreased for a time. The flash unit has to charge up. That would be like repolarization. When I push the button and it flashed, that's depolarization. Now it's going to take some time till it reaches a certain amount of repolarization or recharging in this case, as far as the flash unit goes, before it'll actually flash again. So going back to this, uh, the parts of the refractory period, we can have absolute refractory period, which is complete insensitivity exists to another stimulus from the beginning of action potential until near the end of repolarization. That would be like I'm pressing the button, no matter how many times I press it, nothing happens. Then we have relative refractory period. A stronger than threshold stimulus can initiate another action potential. And we see the relative refractory period right here. Action potential propagation is going to take place in one direction 
in a neuron. Basically, the input is going to come in through the dendrites, through the cell body, and that action potential is then further propagated down the axon. Now, there's a reason why it can only move in one direction. And let's take a look at this animation that'll help explain that. An action potential, depicted as a red band, is propagated in one direction along the axon. During an action potential, the inside of the cell membrane becomes positive with respect to the outside. An action potential generates local currents that tend to depolarize the membrane immediately adjacent to the action potential. When depolarization caused by the local currents reaches threshold, a new action potential is produced adjacent to the original one. Action potential propagation occurs in one direction because the recently depolarized area of the membrane is in absolute refractory period and cannot generate an action potential. Now, have you ever been in a hurry and maybe you have to take the stairs and you need to get up the stairs or down the stairs a lot faster? What might you do? You might skip stairs, right? That'll help you to get up the stairs a little bit quicker or maybe down the stairs a little bit quicker. Um, unless I try that, then if I skip a stair, maybe I would get down to the bottom quicker, but I'd be rolling down. And then once I hit the bottom, of course, then you're going to have to call an ambulance. They're going to load me onto a gurney. They're going to have to take me to the orthopedic unit. Okay, so maybe not a good idea for me. Well, we looked at how an action potential propagates through an axon. And there's a way to propagate that action potential even faster. And the way to do that is to wrap that axon in a myelin sheath by these Schwann cells. So the depolarization is only going to occur in the gaps between the myelin sheath. Okay. Now the gaps, if you remember, are called the nodes of Ranvier. And what's going to happen is the myelin layer is going to prevent the movement of sodium and potassium ions through the axon membrane. So the impulse jumps from node to node. And this process is called saltatory conduction. So think about a somersault. If this action potential um, is going to, um, or the impulse, I should say, is going to jump from node to node. Think about somersaulting from node to node. So that's saltatory conduction. And again, that's going to propagate that action potential in one direction, but it's going to do it a lot faster. The synapse. The synapse is the junction between two cells, and it's going to be the site where action potentials in one cell propagate an action potential in another cell. And the types are going to be presynaptic synapses and postsynaptic synapses. Now an electrical synapse, we use gap junctions and that's going to allow a current to flow between adjacent cells. And we're going to find it in tissues such as cardiac muscle and many types of smooth muscle because these cells have to coordinate with one another uh, on when to contract. They need to contract in unison. So the best way to do that is to communicate directly through these gap junctions with one another. Chemical synapse, the components are going to be the presynaptic terminal, the synaptic cleft, which is the gap, and then the postsynaptic membrane. And we saw this when we learned about how a muscle contracts. The neurotransmitters are released by action potentials in the presynaptic terminal. And the synapt we, we're going to see in this uh, presynaptic terminal um, synaptic vesicles, again, containing the neurotransmitter. When they release the neurotransmitter, it's going to diffuse and then bind to receptors on the postsynaptic membrane. And then in order to 
stop this action from taking place, um, we're going to need some way to remove that neurotransmitter. And there's a couple of different ways to do this. One way that's not mentioned on here is, is diffusion. Um, if there's a lot of the neurotransmitter present, um, then excess neurotransmitter might just diffuse away. Otherwise, we might use an enzyme to break down that uh, neurotransmitter. In this case, we're looking at acetylcholine. So we're going to use the enzyme acetylcholinesterase to actually break the acetylcholine down into choline and acetic acid. And through active transport, we're going to pump or reuptake the choline back into this presynaptic terminal and recombine it with acetic acid. And then we have our acetylcholine made once again, and we store it in the uh, synaptic vesicle. Another way to do that is um, with a pump. Again, this is active transport where we actually pump it back up into um, the uh, presynaptic terminal and put it into a vesicle. Neuronal pathways and circuits. Organization of neurons in the central nervous system varies. We can have convergent pathways, and that's where many neurons are going to converge and synapse with a smaller number of neurons. We can have divergent pathways, and this is where a small number of presynaptic neurons can synapse with a large number of postsynaptic neurons. And then we can also have oscillating circuits, and they're arranged in a circular fashion to allow action potentials to cause a neuron further along the circuit to produce an action potential more than once. And here's an example of oscillating circuits. What this kind of reminds me of, too, is like with a cell tower, for instance. Your cell phone signal can only travel so far, and then it degrades. The cell phone tower then picks up your signal boosts it, and then sends it along to the next tower. And so this is a way that we can repeat um, signals. This is a way we can boost signals. And it's these oscillating circuits that make up our whole neural network and give us things such as cognition and memory and thought.